How can we use technology to change the way human beings think about our relationship to the rest of nature and to the other species on this planet? You know, we study communication because we see it as a window into the intelligences, the lives of other species. And we believe that the more you can understand, the better we're able to protect those species. This project will hopefully yield new insights about the ways in which human pressure through things like ocean noise are affecting the communication and the behavior of these animals. There's a lot more than we need to understand about their communication system. What does each call mean? Once we get at those finer grained details of their acoustic communication, we will be in a much better position to explain to people what kinds of processes underwater noise is interrupting. I'm Valeria Vergara, I'm with the Rincos Conservation Foundation and I co-direct the Cetacean Conservation Research Program with Lance Barrett Leonard. And we have been aboard Achiever, our research boat, for the last two weeks on Northeast Vancouver Island in the Johnston Strait area, piloting a project alongside Earth Species Project about killer whale communication dynamics from above and below. This is using drones and hydrophones and assisted by AI models. The objective would be to make the ocean a healthier place. So most of the work that's been done to date, the emphasis has been on how does noise mask echolocation sounds. Communication sounds, the calls are quite different and noise also masks those calls quite effectively. If we can understand what they're saying or what's important in their lives about using those kinds of calls, we'll be better off in terms of being able to mitigate and, and, and manage underwater noise and make the case for mitigating underwater noise. Killer whales are sort of the, uh, the canary in the coal mine in a sense, but I think the thing that's been missing is an understanding of what these calls are for exactly. What's made it possible in recent years and is the use of drones. Then the other big technological improvement is the ability to process information much more quickly and essentially intelligently than in the past. Drone takeoff checklist. Gloves. Yep. Props. Yep. SD card. Formatted. Country. Uh, Zero, zero, zero on the wind and speed here. Folks, you're clear for takeoff. Valeria? Yes, uh, recording number uh, 18. Hit her really hard. Swing, bada, 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 swing. Damn. That was good. That was real good. Part of what's exciting about this project is that we're going to be able to watch the whales from the air and record them underwater so we have the drone, we have a hydrophone, and we have behavioral observations, and all of that has to be synchronized to the nearest second. Basically, you need a clap. You need the equivalent of a clap. We deployed the hydrophone, and we flew the drone, and we filmed one of us hitting a metal pole that transmits sound into the water, and that's the clap. So then you can align the time of the video with the time of the acoustic recordings when you put the video and the recordings together. We also take behavioral notes in two different kinds of ways. Every five minutes we voice into the recorder the number of boats in the area, the type of boats, whether they are running or idling, how close to achiever those boats are, and a sort of lay of the land in terms of what is happening with the whales in that moment in time. Are the whales dispersed? Are they in a tight group? Is there a high activity level? Oh, and then another person, often Lens, is taking ad-lib behavioral notes on anything that the drone doesn't see because the drone not always can fly on all the group. Oh. <laughs> We're always listening to the hydrophone. It's both connected to speakers and also there's a person with headphones so that you don't miss the very soft calls, the whistles. We look for all those opportunities to shadow our engine and just drift so that we don't introduce noise into our own recordings. Valeria, yeah. can you hear those calls? Okay, yeah. 
that's having these partnerships with international researchers is a really great aspect of the project. A one orca population isn't the same as another. They're, they are an incredibly cultural species, very much as if an alien species was studying humans and only focused on Canadians from BC. Well, they would not understand the human language, really. So I'm here to see how the methodologies are being developed and how they could be applicable to where I work, which is Iceland. How do these methodologies apply to other populations? So we're just going to get a level of understanding of their communication that we just haven't had before. So I think it's going to be super impactful for global understanding of the world communication. Bubbles. There yeah, there's a cup that's been making bubbles alongside the calls. Okay. We can, uh, it's really neat when we can identify who's calling by the bubbles. Yeah. The bubbles are the highlight of this project. <laughs> yeah. That took care of one of our main worries. Initially, we were very skeptical about being able to determine which group was vocalizing or which individual was vocalizing because we don't have a hydrophone array this year. And then suddenly, you know, bubbles. It is wonderful. We're getting to the point where we really would love to get home and determine how many individuals we have been able to record throughout these two weeks. Having a collaboration with an organization like Grain Coast, where we are pioneering new methods of data collection, is really, really valuable, allowing us to find new ways of using AI to analyze it. What can we learn from that? here under the waters. We have a species that is as cultural, as long-lived, as social, and as communicative as humans, and as difficult to understand. So we're, we, we are very excited to continue.